Hello everyone, welcome back to part two of this two-part Mammoth special episode. Mammoth as in it's about mammoths, and Mammoth as in it's also enormous. Giant, huge subject matter. This is a big one. This is a big one for me personally. I love mammoths. They're one of my favorite cryptids. If you don't know what a cryptid is, it is a word that we use for any animal that is studied within cryptozoology. Cryptozoology, of course, is the study of hidden animals. And it includes things such as Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, giant spiders in the Amazon, but also creatures that have survived past when they supposedly went extinct. Now, this may seem ridiculous and elements of cryptozoology can certainly be called ridiculous. It's all across the board and it's a multifaceted issue, but specifically talking about mammoths, this one is specifically interesting because of the amount of sightings that have happened over just the last couple hundred years. And we will dive into that. We will dive into, you know, how likely it really is that mammoths have survived either to the present day or at least into recent history. But before that, I do want to remind you that mammoths died out only 10,000 years ago, which is nothing on the grand scheme of the history of the Earth. And in fact, it was much more recently that the very last surviving members of the mammoth species died out on Wrangell Island in Siberia. Those mammoths lived to 1600 BC which means that they existed alongside the pyramids for about a thousand years. So if anybody tells you it's ridiculous that mammoths are still alive, you just hit him with that fact. Just smack him with it. The other thing I want to talk about before we dive into these sightings is just the sheer immensity of the Siberian and Canadian wilderness. The Arctic region, the tundra, is an enormous ecosystem with actually very, very little human habitation. Anybody who has gone to, you know, Northern Alaska or has spent a lot of times up in those parts of Canada or Siberia would know that uh, something could live there for a very long time without being detected. As modern humans, we kind of get this egotistical idea that we've kind of just seen everything on the face of the earth or that we have a pretty good bead on what's out there because we can look at Google Maps. But that's actually sort of an illusion. The reality is that there are hundreds and hundreds of square miles still left on this planet that are little or not explored at all by human beings. And I know that might sound ridiculous, but the planet's actually just massively enormous. One of the examples people often give is of the Mapinguari, a potential surviving giant ground sloth in the Amazon. And people think that that's a ridiculous idea that they survived for tens of thousands of years after their extinction. There is so much Amazon rainforest that you could not see it all in a single human lifetime. If you devoted your life to trying to see the entire Amazon, you would never get there. In fact, if you walked through the Amazon, it would take you 1,500 years to see it all. And as far as the tundra regions go of our planet, it would actually take you 2,100 years to see the entire thing if you walked over all of that ecosystem. That's what I want to establish in your brain right now of, of just how massive this stuff is. It would literally take, if you were walking since the time of Christ to today, you could not see all of the Siberian or Canadian wilderness, the tundra that exists on this planet. You couldn't see it all in two millennia, which makes it a little more realistic that something could be living there that is still undiscovered by humans. And suppose you were the kind of person that spent maybe, let's say, decades of your life exploring these regions. Let's say you were the kind of person that really just lived out there in the wilderness. Well, some of those people have reported seeing mammoths. The first sighting we're going to talk about actually comes from the year 1581. The Cossack chief Yermak Timofeyevich reported to explorers that he and his tribal members had seen monstrous hairy beasts. These were unlike the other animals that supposedly lived in the tundra region where his tribe resided. Reportedly, these were valued as food and they actually called them mountains of meat. Now, 1581 was a long time ago, but it is not inconceivable to think that mammoths lived long enough to be seen by some of those indigenous peoples, or even maybe an ancestral memory that those people carried with them for generations, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Because our next sighting actually happened as recently as 1807. David Thompson was an explorer explorer and mapper of Western Canada. And in this year, he actually talked to an indigenous chief that told him an interesting story. He wrote, the old chief and others related that in the woods of the mountains, there is a very large animal of about the height of three fathoms, a fathom being six feet, and great bulk 
which never lies down, but in sleeping always leans against a large tree to support his weight. They believe, they say, that he has no joints in the mid of his legs, but they are not sure as they have not killed any of them, and by the time of this account they are rarely or never seen. Now David Thompson goes on to make it clear that they are not talking about a moose or another large creature, that this was something else entirely. And at 18 feet tall, that would kind of preclude a lot of the animals that we know live in that region. Now our next report comes from 1889. This comes from a Colonel F. Fowler that lived in Alaska for 12 years. This is one of those people that spent a very long time by themselves out in the tundra wilderness. He wrote that two years before he visited an Inuit chief named Toli Tima. Toli Tima reportedly had several thousand pounds of mammoth ivory that Fowler was interested in purchasing. Now this is not uncommon. Mammoth ivory is plentiful up in the northern regions because of how densely populated those regions used to be of mammoths and those mammoths left the ivory behind. But Fowler noted something interesting. Some of the tusks still had blood and flesh on them. When asked about this, Toli Tima reported that less than three months before, a party of young men went out to hunt these creatures. They encountered a drove of these monsters about 50 miles from where the Inuit chief was telling Fowler this story. These men succeeded in killing two of the monsters, a cow and a bull and that those were the ones that they harvested the tusks from. They called them big teeth and said that they had encountered them while they were searching for ivory, which was frozen into the permafrost. And the most interesting part is that this Inuit chief reported that these animals made shrill trumpet-like calls. That's something that a frozen body of a mammoth couldn't do. But there's more. We also have the 1899 account from Henry Tuchman. Now the details of this report are unsubstantiated, so take it with a grain of salt, but we do know Henry Tuchman was a real person who really did make this report. Henry says that in this year, in 1899, he actually found and shot a mammoth, killing it. He said he donated the body to the Smithsonian Institution. The Smithsonian Institution, of course, denied any knowledge of this event happening. Therefore, it is impossible to substantiate it. There's no second-hand or first-hand documents relating to this event. But the Smithsonian also hasn't been completely fully straightforward in all of its dealings in the past. So that's just something interesting to note. We'll maybe talk about that more in another video. In 1920, there was a French diplomat who was stationed in Vladivostok, Russia, and he heard a curious account from a Russian trapper who had lived in the area for most of their life. This fur trapper claimed to have seen large, shaggy elephants in the tundra. This fur trapper claimed to have seen large, furry elephants deep, deep in the taiga where no one had gone before. He actually called them denizens of the forest rather than of the frozen open tundra. This would be interesting and would also explain some of the reasons of why these mammoths would have been difficult to track or notice before now. Another interesting part of this story is when the diplomat engaged him in conversations about mammoths, this fur trapper seemed to not have any idea what mammoths were. He was familiar with the concept of elephants and a hairy shaggy elephant was something that was completely a, a new idea to him, lending a little bit of credence to this story. Now that same year, in 1920, there was a Russian explorer by the name of Georgi Bashkarov. Now, Bashkarov's account is particularly interesting because he said he had a face-to-face -face encounter with one of these living mammoths. He said that while leading an expedition through the Yakutia region, Bashkarov says he saw an enormous reddish-brown creature with great curving tusks emerge from the forest. He said he saw it wade into a nearby river and disappear. Bashkarov, convinced that he saw a living mammoth, tried to tell his story for years. Unfortunately, he didn't seem to be able to convince very many people, but he stuck to that story for the remainder of his life. 1920 seemed to be a popular year to see mammoth, because our next story comes from that same year as well. Another French official stationed in Vladivostok named M. Gaillon, I don't know if I pronounced that right because I know nothing about French, this Frenchman spoke to a Russian witness who reportedly saw giant, enormous, elephant-like footprints. Now this sighting took place in 1918, but was reported in 1920. This witness followed the tracks and reportedly saw a giant elephant tusked animal out in the Russian wilderness. Our next account comes from 1948. This comes from the crew of a Soviet aircraft. They were also flying over a remote corner of the Yakutia region. This crew claims to have spotted an entire herd of mammoth-like animals. Now this sighting was never confirmed by anybody else besides this crew, but they also stuck to this story, and there were multiple of them that did so. And this same year, 1948, a series of mysterious tracks were discovered in 
another region of Russia, the Chukotka region of northeastern Siberia. These tracks were supposedly 27 inches wide and 20 inches long. They were far larger than those of any known modern animal. They were also spaced in a manner that suggested a creature taking long, ponderous strides. These tracks were also found in association with trees that were splintered high above the ground, higher than any known animal could reach. And if those sightings weren't enough for you, these next two have a little bit more credibility to them. In 1978, a group of geologists were working along the banks of Siberia's Indigirka River. They had an astonishing encounter with over a dozen mammoths that they watched drink at the edge of the river and then disappear back into the forest. And in 2015, only a decade ago, Scientists at a remote monitoring station in the Alaskan wilderness recorded data of rhythmic footfalls. These footfalls were of an intensity that suggested an immense creature. And that's not all. Upon reaching the site of the recording equipment, the equipment that they had left to monitor the surroundings, the researchers found the equipment itself crushed and mangled by an unknown immense force. Now each and every one of these sightings probably strike you on their own as ridiculous, but it's in looking at the vastness of them put together that we can start to see that maybe the likelihood of mammoths surviving to the present day isn't zero. Especially when taking into account that maybe these mammoths exhibited different behavioral patterns from the mammoths that we've observed historically, such as dwelling primarily in the forests rather than in the open fields. This would allow them to stay hidden for a lot longer. And in fact, one has to think that potentially mammoths who exhibited this behavior would have been the ones to survive extinction. Those would have been the ones that were more resistant to the human attacks, which was, as we said in the last video, it was combined with a lot of other issues, including environmental change, potentially a comet impact. But human predation was definitely a factor in the extinction of mammoths, even if that was in finishing the mammoths off at the end. It would have been a lot harder to hunt the mammoths that were adapted to and lived inside that dense forests of this inhospitable region of the earth. I'm not saying anything for sure, but I'm, I'm hoping to open your mind to the possibility. Again, we live on a planet that is still full of corners that are very unexplored. Some of those corners which have actually never been seen before by human eyes. And for the skeptics out there, I hear you. I've studied this sort of subject matter enough to understand where your arguments are coming from. And actually, as a gift to you, I'm going to give you two debunkings in this video. The first is of footage that came out in 2012. This was widely disseminated on YouTube and purported to show a mammoth crossing the river. This footage is verifiably fake. And you can actually see the original footage where the CEI creature was was inserted much later. A year later in 2013, potentially partly because of the hype of the first video, a second video of a surviving mammoth was circulated as well. This was supposedly grainy footage from the 1940s of a mammoth encounter. But online sleuths were quick to find that this footage of the mammoth was actually from the show Walking with Beasts, and it had been flipped, and then there was a filter of black and white graininess that was put over it. As of today, there's no footage out there of any mammoths that we have reason to believe is actually authentic. But that doesn't mean that all of these sightings are fake. Another part of the mystery is that indigenous populations were quite aware that mammoths had once roamed the earth. In fact, we have found many, many examples of mammoths frozen pretty intactly in the permafrost. And a lot of people think these reports maybe stemmed out of, you know, seeing the frozen bodies of these creatures in the snow. For example, the Yakut people, a Siberian native tribe, refers to mammoths as earth oxen and says that they are burrowing creatures because their bodies are often found underground. I find that a fascinating piece of folklore, but I'm also hesitant to say that every single one of the sightings of native peoples is because they found the carcasses of mammoths. Anthropologists unfortunately often think that they know better than the native populations. And I personally would think that if a native population told you they saw and fought and hunted living mammoths, I would probably be inclined to listen to them. There are many examples of native people having knowledge passed down to them that have been regarded as silly tales or fables that have later been verified by actual science. For example, the native tribes of the Pacific Northwest, such as the Yakima and Spokane, have legends of a great flood that covered the land. For years and years, white anthropologists thought that these legends were 
fictional. That is until geologists discovered the Missoula floods, where glacial dam breaks released massive floods across the region. These floods explain many of the geological features of the region, such as the scab lands and erratic boulders. And those floods happened 13 to 15,000 years ago, meaning that these indigenous individuals carried these legends through generations and generations. Another example is the Klamath people of Oregon. They had an oral tradition of a great battle between good and evil gods. This battle collapsed an entire mountain into what is now Crater Lake. Well, modern geology confirmed that around 7,700 years ago, Mount Mazama erupted catastrophically and it actually did create Crater Lake. This oral tradition was a record of something that happened in reality. There's also the fact that Aboriginal Australians knew about the thylacine, a creature which went extinct in mainland Australia 4,000 years ago. And also over 20 tribes of Aboriginal Australians describe parts of Australia being swallowed up by the sea, sometimes even naming specific locations that are now underwater. Some of these sea level rises happened over 10,000 years ago, including one that happened up to 30,000 years ago. And that's not the only part of the world where this happens. The Haida people of British Columbia have oral traditions of a tsunami happening about in the year 1700. Polynesians claim their ancestors navigated the ocean using the stars, bird behavior, waves, and cloud formations. And while Western scientists initially dismissed these claims as exaggerated, modern experience have confirmed that the Polynesians mastered celestial navigation thousands of years ago, exploring nearly the entire Pacific Ocean. The Inuit people of Greenland had a legend of red snow which would kill you. Well, modern scientists discovered that this was probably due to Chlamydominus nivalis, a red algae that blooms in cold climates. It can actually tint the snow red and it can also be dangerous. The key takeaway is that Western society for some reason decided that myths and legends were silly, that they held no value other than being interesting cultural stories. When in reality, there is an immense amount of anthropological and scientific data preserved in these stories. These are things that we can learn from. And I wanna introduce a word to you right now. It's called presentism. It's the tendency for people in the present to look down upon people in the past as inferior or less intelligent. In reality, our ancestors had wealths of knowledge that have unfortunately been forgotten. We may have the scientific method nowadays, but they had eons of experience from which to pull information and wisdom. And I'm not knocking either of those two things. I think we can live in a world where we take the wisdom from the path and move forward into the wisdom of the future. And that's why more than anything, I wanted to do this two-part series on the mammoth. It represents for me something from our distant path, a relationship we had with an animal that's either not around anymore or that's very, very rare. And it also represents our ability to use bioengineering and science to create something new. I think that's a big theme of this channel is reaching into the past and reaching towards the future, grabbing on both, and then finding where we are in the present, finding the connection between those things. We are who we used to be, and we're also who we will be if we so choose. But the most important is that we are who we are right now, and that right now matters. The myths that we learn from and the myths that we can create in the future all depend on how those things connect right now in the present. Because the past had yesterday, and the future has tomorrow, but today is yours. Right now, you're alive. That means something. No matter who you are, no matter what your story was or will be, you are here right now, and that is significant, and that is important. And I'm so glad you're all with me in this journey to figure out what that can be together. So go out and do something incredible with it. Go out and do something outlandish.